Good afternoon guys, my name is Brandon and today we've got a metal fabrication project to do. And since it's been a while since we've done some stick welding, that's what we're gonna do. Since it's been a while since we've done some stick welding, I figured today would be a great project to bust this out on. Let me bring you in, show you real quick what we're gonna be working on, get you up to speed and then we'll get going. So this is a continuation of a project that we've been working on, but what I did was is I added this component for this floating shelf and I added the component for this floating shelf. If you want to see how we built all of this prior to these floating shelves, I'll put a link up above. So if you guys are ready to do some metal fabrication and stick welding, let's get going. So welcome back guys. Now, just when I thought we were done with that project, I got looking at it and it just looked like it needed something more. So, you know, if you're gonna do something, you might as well do it right and make it look aesthetically pleasing and that's what I wanted to do here. So that involved adding some additional shelves to fill in that big space in between. But I figured we'd pull a little twist on that and we'd do what appears to be like a floating shelf. Just something a little different. So now I'm just taking some measurements of what I'm gonna need. Now, what I like to do is, is I like to cut as much of the stuff that I can confidently cut uh, so that I know that I'm making the right cuts and I'm not wasting material. That way it allows me to uh, build as much of the stuff as I can in one process. So I'm not going from cutting to grinding to welding back to cutting to grinding to welding. I like to try to do one process as complete as I can before I move on to the next. And you can see how quick it is to set up and make a nice accurate cut. You just need a little tick mark and that's it. Now if you guys have ever used a chop saw on cutting wood, it cuts like that. It cuts that fast. This saw is amazing. Here's a little trick on making rounded edges or radius edges. I just use a little flat washer and trace the flat washer onto the part. And you know, you can change the size of the radius by changing the size of the washer. Just something real simple to do. And now once you trace it, it gives you a nice accurate line once you bring it to the grinder. You can do it by hand. You could clamp this in a vise, but uh, I just bring it over to the bench grinder and uh, clean it up and there we go. So with all my pieces cut, now it's time to move on to the next process. Now these are going to be where the shelves actually get screwed into this metal. And again, to save time, I've got both pieces clamped together. So I'm drilling two at once. If you're anything like me, you probably can't cut a good straight line. So here's a little trick on how to do that. So now what I want to do is I want to just ease the edge. And the way I do that is I use a round over bit in a router zip. So here you can see I've got my metal pieces in front of me, all the holes are drilled, it's all prepped, and I just find that the workshop stays cleaner that way and I stay more focused and organized that way. That way you don't have you know 200 tools out to do all these different operations. But, uh, so now I'm sanding this down, I'm starting out with 120 grit sandpaper, this is just regular pine, and then I finish it out with 220. Then after that I wanted to do a burned finish and then stain it with a light stain. But then I just realized there that uh, I hadn't burned it, so uh, it worked out okay, but I'm glad I caught it when I did because I really shouldn't have stained it before I burned it. I wanted to burn it first and then stain it. I think maybe the stain is flammable, I don't know, but uh, it came out evenly, but I love how this looks. Check this out. Look how that grain just kind of like pops and just shows up. I just love the looks of it. it looks really warm. Alright, so now we've got our wood all stained, and next thing we got to do is we're going to start doing a little bit of welding. And then we're going to have a third side that goes over here. So this is where we're going to start. We're going to do this little perimeter detail first. And since it's been a while since we've done some stick welding on the channel, I figured I would break out, which is hands down, without a doubt, my favorite stick welder that I have. Now this one, uh, I'll leave a link up above if you want to know more about it, but just real briefly, this is an inverter welder. Uh, it'll do uh, stick and it will do lift start TIG. And it's also dual voltage, meaning that it runs on uh, 120 and 240. It comes with an adapter plug and it does all of that uh, automatically. You don't have to set anything. You just plug it in and it figures out what you need to do. Now we need to select a rod for this. So the material that we're using is pretty thin. So it's going to be eighth inch. So we're going to need a fairly thin electrode. So we're going to use uh, some sixteenth inch 6013. Well, let's just say you had uh, what you thought was some thin rods 
sitting in a container and you didn't really know what the amperage was or what you should be running them at. Well, I'm going to give you a quick tip on some resources, how to figure that out. So what you're going to want to do is spool up your phone or your computer and uh, in the search bar just type in Will, uh, Miller Welds Calculator and that'll bring you to a Miller website and this is uh, a weld setting calculator and the address is millerwelds.com I'll put a link down in the description so what we're doing here is we're going to be stick welding so we'll click on stick welding and then it's asking us to select a material so we are working on mild steel and then we're going to select electrode right there and we're going to be using 6013 and it's 16th inch so 6013 16th inch right there and there you go that gives us a little bit of specs so DC electrode positive is what we're going to be using also called reverse polarity uh, it has low penetration which is what we want because we don't want to blow through and it's an all position rod and then it gives a little bit of characteristics about the weld down below. 6013, uh, some people don't really like to use them. I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's really the only size rod that I have right now that would work well with this thin material. And 6013 is generally considered like an all-purpose rod. Uh, it's used a lot with really thin metals or sheet metal, but whereas, like I said, this is eighth inch, maybe a good rod for this. You can see right here, the suggested amperage range, 20 to 45 amps. So we're gonna start on the low side, just, you know, we can work our way up. I'll start out with the test piece and we'll go from there. So the next order of business, let's get this thing fired up. So, real simple operation, turn it on. We're in stick mode and now we're gonna start at 20 amps. See how that works? And let's fire it up. I've got some small little scrap pieces of eighth inch test piece and I'm gonna try it out and see how it does. I always like to test on a little test piece like I'm doing here to get all my settings dialed in right so that I know that it's uh, working right. It kind of helps me uh, get my body in the uh, process, especially if you're not doing it every day. Uh, but it just kind of like gets you in the groove of it. So any adjustments or mistakes that you might make, you're not making them on your finished work piece. You're actually doing them on something that you can throw away. And uh, then you can get it all dialed in and, and you're good to go when your project starts. See, that's what that joint fit up looks like. Right there. Now this is only gonna get welded on the outside corners. It's not gonna have anything on the inside. So I start out by tacking everything together. I never just fully weld stuff. Um, tack it all together, get it so it fits up nice and you've got a nice 90 degree corner. And then you can weld it out once you know that it's right. But uh, 6013 has a real fluidy weld puddle. And I find that for me, what works best uh, so that I don't get slag or like wormholes within my weld. If you guys are experienced using some 6013, you'll know that it, it seems like it's real easy to get wormholes in your weld. Well, what I like to do is I'll hold a little bit of a steeper drag angle when I'm welding, especially in the horizontal position, and it seems to, uh, like the force just seems to keep the slag from being included within the weld puddle. Just just a little tip that I find that works well for me, especially working with uh, thinner material. But I'll tell you, this has a nice uh, slag that you can peel off. And you'll see here pretty soon, we've got a couple uh, places where the slag peeled right off. It just, I don't know, it's always fun to do when you weld something up and the slag actually just kind of like falls off or you can flick it off with your finger. It's just fun. So now the next thing we got to do is I got to weld on this little component right here. And what that is, that's this little piece here. So there'll be a screw and a screw that goes up through that'll hold the shelf in place. Then after we get this welded in, then we can weld on this little band. You can also use 7018 rods. Uh, that would be a good uh, rod for this type of project. I didn't have any that were small enough, so that's why I went with a 16th inch 6013. Ah, look at that, the slag's peeling off. Hold on, let me bring you in. That's like weld porn right there, watch. Ha! 
and there's the slag right there that fell off. These little 16th inch welding rods have a tendency to be real springy when you're trying to have a nice steady hand. One thing that I find that I do is I'll rest my hand on the middle of the rod which keeps it from springing, almost like a pencil. I did it in the previous clips. Okay, so here are the pieces that we just welded right here, okay? And you can see how this end is basically going to free float just out in the open. There's going to be nothing secure in it. This is where a couple screws will go down through that uh, wood top. but so that this end doesn't rack this way or it's tipped up or it's tipped down I put a strong back along here and then I just clamped this to it so this little strong back's just temporary you can see what I've done here so that makes sure that this that strong back is running parallel to the top and middle shelf and then I've just clamped this piece to it so that way I know that it won't rack up or down. So then I'm just going to put a weld here. And then we're going to put a weld on the back side over here. And once that's done, then I can pull that strong back off. And I know that this will uh, be level. And it'll be right. And then we just got to do the same thing down here. And here's a look at that strong back on the back side. Like I said, this will come off after we're done welding it. That's just to ensure that this little leg doesn't start getting warped up while we're welding it. You know, one of the real important steps, if you guys are looking to do a really good job and have a real quality looking weld, uh, part of that is body positioning. Making sure that you're actually comfortable and that you can actually feed in the wire properly with your hand uh, and make it consistent. Ha! She's peeling slag again. Hang on folks, we got some slag corn twice in one day. And I bumped that up 8 amps. I'm at 28 amps now. You'll find that when you do this, that some of your best welds are going to be when you were comfortable, you were relaxed, and you were at ease. And that's meaning you're feeding the rod in and metering it in good. Ha, ha, ha. She's peeling again. So we're going to have to put this up on the Instagram, guys. So now, these pieces that we just added, I gotta get them to match in to what's already here. So to do that, we used a smart stain from a company called Sculpt Nouveau. And it's pretty simple, you just spray it on. That's how I do it, spray it on with a sprayer and just wipe it down with a rag and uh, then it turns it black. So when I previously did this project, I had already stained it with this same metal stain and all of that. So I was a bit concerned knowing that I had to weld on it again. You know, thinking that if you guys have ever welded on something that's been painted, uh, you have to grind it back. And then if the paint gets hot, then it starts like curling at the edges. And now you've got some issues with blending in the old existing paint into the new paint. I had none of that stuff at all. This didn't uh, curl back or crinkle back like that when it got hot. So this stain worked out really good. I just wire brushed it away and that was it. So one of the many ways that I finish my wood projects is to use a, pa like a paste wax. Uh, that's just one of the ways I like to do it. Uh, it's just like wax in a car. You put this on, let it dry 10 or 15 minutes, then you just wipe it off. You can buff it and it just leaves kind of like a hard shell. But I like this is that it doesn't leave a uh, like a shine to it like a polyurethane would. So it just kind of like brings out the, the tones in the wood without adding a shine. This is natural but you can get this stuff uh, tinted in different colors or whatever. I'll show you what it looks like inside. That's the, that's the rag I put it on with, but you can see that. It kind of has a, uh, no, it kind of smells like uh, a solvent, basically. So what I do is I take my little, you guys see me use this tool all the time. It's a three-in-one tool. It's made for painting, but I use it for everything. Um, you can pull off covers to stuff. It's got a nice little pick. I use this to scrape BBs off metal, um, but I take this and then I just, kind of pull a little dollop out and then just lather it on the wood. Now I've never tried to use this finish 
outside or in an exterior application. I've always used it inside, but uh, if you guys have ever used it outside, let me know uh, how it works. I've never tried it. Uh, kind of curious how it would work, but it does have like a hard type finish when it dries and it's nice so and smooth. You see how that kind of like richens it up? You notice how this is kind of like turned a little bit darker? Just because it kind of like pulls up the grain and it just, um, it almost feels like you're putting on like a tongue oil or a, or a thick oil and then when it dries, it dries and you can actually, it's like real smooth, but it's not sticky or greasy. It's just real good stuff. I like using it. So in about 10 minutes, we'll buff this out. Right around this time in the project is when it starts feeling really good because you can see that your project is almost done and all the hard work that you've been putting into this, it's all starting to come together into a finished project that you can be proud of. And just look at the finish on that, how nice and rich that finish looks. Sometimes when you build these things though, especially when they're for other people, you actually look at them and you want them for yourself. And that's what I find I end up doing a lot. Now I want one of these. And here's the finished project guys with the shelves all attached. I really like this look of this floating shelf. And this is what it looks like from the underside. So let me walk you around. And you can see how it looks from the back. And all the screws that you see, those are all stainless steel. So we don't have to worry about any rusting or corrosion over time. And that's all there is to it, guys. Be sure to tune in each week. There's a new video up every Friday for fabrication tips and welding tips. I want to thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for tuning in. If this is something that you like, please don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. I'll see you next week. Till then, stay safe.